Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus. The text from Hebrews chapter 3 is before us this morning because of its connection to Moses. Transfiguration is a day on which we remember that Jesus went up on a mountain as a man and showed that he was God. Now, he did that as well when he rose from the dead. But we're talking now about him letting the divine that was and is him just kind of break out of his body, just exist before us. Whether or not that's exactly how we'll see him in paradise, I don't know. But Revelation is very clear that the light in paradise will come from Jesus and not from the Son. So it's the same kind of idea, at least, that on this mountain this one day, he just blasts his light everywhere. And as this is happening with Peter and James watching, Moses and Elijah are standing there in conversation with them about his departure. That's actually the word exodus in the Greek, about his exit. That is, about his death. Now we could go further into that idea all by itself, but again, so Moses and Elijah are there, these two greatest of all the ancient prophets. The two, and we would say, greatest because of the deeds that they did. David certainly had a great deal of prophecy. Isaiah saw fantastic things, but these two guys had more divine actions in their life than anybody else. As the text actually describes, that Moses did all of these terrifying works. That bit from Deuteronomy a moment ago, that the people wept because no one could, had done the things that he had done. And no one arose like him afterwards. Well, Elijah was indeed quite a bit like him, and of course Jesus is more like him. He is the greatest of all. But these two guys stand apart from the rest of the Old Testament, and then they're apart in this other way as well. Which is that we don't know where either of their bodies are. Moses, the text very clearly said, died and God buried him in the land, but we don't know where it is. And then Elijah, you may remember, was taken up to heaven in a chariot of fire with the horses of fire and the chariots of Israel surrounding him. So you have these two great prophets with two disappeared bodies now standing on the mountain talking to Jesus. And there is much that we could ponder there, but the text would have us then ask, what can we learn about Moses? And then Hebrews takes us to learn something about Moses. And from Moses, we're told to learn something about Jesus. And what we're to learn from Jesus, according to the text in Hebrews this morning, is not one of gospel, but one of law. A thing of commitment, or direction, or drive, or stability. This is not without gospel. This is on the foundation of the gospel. When it begins in verse 1 of chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 3, saying, Therefore, my brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling... The heavenly calling is the gospel. And what he's going to say next is going to be built upon that heavenly calling. If you go back in the text just a little ways into chapter 2, you hear him talking about who Jesus is and what he has done for you. That is again the heavenly calling. It says in verse 14 of chapter 2, Since therefore the children share in the flesh and blood, He himself, that's Jesus, likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who, through fear of death, were subject to lifelong slavery. So, again, the gospel. Christ took on our flesh and blood, becoming like us in every way but without sin, in order to die on the cross, that in that death he could conquer death. By being God dead. Since it's a battle between death and God, who must win? It must be God. Death could not contain him. And so coming forth from that tomb, he destroyed the power of death, which then the text tells us is the power of the devil. The devil who reigns over this present age by keeping humans bound in our fear of death. Now, Maybe most people that you run into on a daily basis don't talk about the fear of death. They don't express that they actually are afraid of it. But I would wager that if you took a step back and you you looked at the reasons for most of the decisions we make almost all the time, it comes back to trying to avoid death. Or at the very least, trying not to think about 
death. This becomes all the more evident when someone who you love is near death. I'm always a bit surprised when visiting a family of Christians and they have a loved one who is nearing death and all they can talk about is how the healthcare system will stop them from dying. Now, there's nothing wrong with the healthcare system helping us live longer, healthier lives if it does that. But it is definitely wrong to try to avoid death at all costs and to be so afraid of it that you can't face it when it actually comes, as opposed to walking headlong into it as Christians, knowing that it can't contain us because it can't contain our Lord that it has no power over us, that it is but a passageway to rest and sleep in uh, divine paradise in Christ in heaven, which then is only, again, the waiting room for the ultimate paradise of the resurrection. Have you caught it yet? I'm saying it now almost every week. You are immortal. You are immortal. Death can't contain you because Christ has conquered it for you. And that fearlessness is there to combat the fear of death, which we carry in our flesh. If you're a Christian, you're bound to have the fear of death in your flesh. What it should really do is awaken us to see the fear of death in our flesh and call it what it is. Be aware of it. Even confess it. And bring it to the supper and bury it in the forgiveness that's given there. The world, however, has no such antidote. It has no way to battle the fear of death but by trying not to die. There is a movement out there. I don't know how strong it is at this point. Uh, It is a group of people looking for what they call the singularity. The singularity is the moment in history that they believe will come when man and machine are able to merge. And in doing so, they'll be able to take their self, their mind, I don't know, soul if they believe in such a thing, whatever it is, their life, who they are, and put it into a machine so that they can become a different kind of immortal. You might think this is a little crazy, but there are very wealthy, very wise people pursuing this movement. And there's only one possible reason they could do so. The fear of death. They want to live longer here. And you might ask yourself another question. When you look at the world and you listen to all the things people are saying about the world, of how, in fact, I heard one politician just this last week, maybe two weeks ago, saying that the world is such a terrible place now and the dangers are so great, and I won't, I won't go into which dangers this person thought were dangerous, the dangers are so great that it is amoral to have children now. It is wrong to bring children into this world. And yet, I would wager this person still wants to live here, just like everybody else. We want to keep our lives here as long as we can. But there's something kind of right about what was being said. The dangers are great. The sin is real. The problems are painful. Why are we so hung up on staying here? It's a fair question. Christians have the antidote that through death, Christ has conquered death. And this is the gospel, the good news that frees you from lifelong slavery in conscience and mind to the devil's lie that you have to be your own God. The author goes on in verse 16 to say, It is not the angels who help us, but the offspring of Abraham, that is, Jesus, the one descended from the line of David, Abraham, Noah, Adam, and so forth. I'm not exactly sure why in the text the author of the Hebrews wants to say it's not the angels who help. Other than that, for the first two chapters, he's been expressing how Christ is not an angel. That the angels are fine, they're good, but that Christ is far greater than these angels. Not to hurt my Roman Catholic friend's feelings too much, but I might point this out as a text that says we should not pray to anyone other than Christ. Praying to the saints and to the angels for aid is missing the point. The one who can help is God, and if you want the angels to help you, they need God to send them. It is not the angels who help, but it is Jesus. Therefore, Jesus, he, verse 17, had to be made like his brothers in every respect. That is, he had to be just like us. He had to be born of human flesh. He had to carry the burden of life in this world. He suffered for us by being under everything that we have, the only exception being his own sin. He had none of his own sin, but he certainly walked in your sin. He carried the results of sin upon his shoulders. 
So while he was not a sinner in the technical sense, he was one who knew sin deeply and intimately, maybe more than we do, because he would never have been blind to it the way that we are. He was made like us in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. A high priest exists for one reason, to make a sacrifice. And that is what he does. Mercifully, faithfully, he offers himself up as a sacrifice. Next time you see this thing, oh, look at that. came right off. I've ne- that scares me now. Next time you see this thing processing, make sure you take a look. At the back, where there is behind Christ on the cross a lamb slain with blood pouring from his side. That's intentional, right? That Christ is not just dying, but he is atoning. He is paying with blood in sacrificial high priestly form. And that is the mercy of God to you, to, as the text says, great big word, probably the best big word in the Bible, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Propitiation. I feel like I may have taught you this before. If you want to remember that word, you need to know who the Rolling Stones are. They sing a very famous song. Everyone knows the tune. It goes, I can't get no propitiation. Except it doesn't, right? But it does. Same meaning. Satisfaction. Right? Christ satisfies the wrath of God against evil at this moment. He propitiates. Because he himself suffered when tempted, he is able to help we who are being tempted. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in the calling of knowing this, consider Jesus, he says. I thought that's what we've been doing, is considering Jesus. But he means now, consider Jesus' behavior. Consider Jesus' commitment as you consider your own. Jesus is, he calls him, verse 1 now, we're back in again, the apostle and high priest of our confession. So now apostle's different than high priest. High priest makes sacrifices. Apostle preaches, speaks. He is the speaker of what we then confess. To confess means to speak again, to say the same thing or to repeat. He is the high priest of our words. Jesus, the apostle, the high priest, who? as those things, was faithful to him who appointed him. You, holy brothers, consider Jesus, who was faithful to God in doing what God sent Jesus to do. I can't stand that in the backwards. I'm going to turn it back around. He was faithful to God in doing what God sent him to do. And what the apostle writing the letter here has in mind is that you would consider that action that he took, desiring to be faithful in his calling, and apply that, pursue that, to your own life. To use the words of James a little bit here, that you would not be as one who looks at your faith and the words of God in a mirror, the way you might look at your reflection, and then turns around and forgets what you saw, but instead would see that reflection clearly, and then turn around and act upon what you know that you have seen. Jesus did that, not only for you, but as what we are to aspire to be. So now we have law and gospel standing beside each other, and we definitely want to be careful. We do not want to commingle them. We don't want them to be confused with each other. He did it for you, and that's it. That's done. That's the work of salvation. Salvation is into a new life. That new life is lived according to the love of what God designed us to be. What God designed us to be is the law. And so what he did for you also exhibits a goal for you to strive to be. Even more than that, which you will strive to be. For faith does not lie inactive in your soul. Faith drives you to speak, to do, and to act. Unless, of course, you reject that. Consider Jesus, who was faithful. Then he says, consider Moses who is faithful over all God's house. So now Moses is being brought up as an example of one who is given a stewardship and a trust and supposed to act in a certain way. He had, of all people in the history of this world, I do not envy Moses. He had the most horrible job. Eighty years he had to deal with people who refused to listen to anything that he said, even though he never got to say what he thought. And the one time he said what he thought, God stopped him from entering the promised land on account of it. And we heard that read about today. He gets mad and he speaks with his own mind. He strikes a rock he's supposed to talk to. And instead he has to die of entering the promised land. 
But for most of his life, he was faithful. And after that, of course, as well, it wasn't like he was kicked out for that, kicked out of faith. But he was faithful in the stewardship of caring and governing the people of Israel as they wandered in their, their confusion, their lostness, their inability to believe, even then wandering all the way up to where the promises begin to fulfill, be fulfilled of entering the land. He was faithful as a human, right? As a leader. Consider that for your faith, it says. Now, he then immediately goes into a tangent in verse 3. He doesn't want us to get confused and think that Moses is the equal of Jesus. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has honor over the house itself. And in case you don't understand, he goes on to say, For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. So his point here, again a tangent, a a different direction in the conversation, is to say, I'm using Jesus as an example of how you consider what it looks like to be faithful to what you're called to do. I'm going to use Moses as an example for you to consider what it looks like to be faithful of your call to do. But don't make any mistake, Jesus is way different than Moses. Jesus is a builder of a house, Moses is the house. Totally different things, right? Totally different things. But verse 5 returns us to the main thought, to how you consider Moses as faithful to what he's called to do. Verse 5 says, Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. So what was Moses' stewardship first and foremost? But to have words from God that he heard that then he spoke again. And this is by all means your great calling as a Christian. It is not merely to hear and believe and walk away and forget, but to hear and believe words which then become your words in the world. I'm not talking about how you have to go out and tell everybody you meet about how they need to come to St. Paul. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I am saying, though, is that when you recite the Ten Commandments, and when you recite the Apostles' Creed, and when you pray the Lord's Prayer, that these words become what your mind lives on, how you discern the world around you with, Where you put your hope when faced with trial and tribulation. And who you pray to. Who you pray to. Do you pray? Do you pray? Because that's what I'm talking about. Your calling is to know who God really is. And have words on your mouth to Him in every trial and need. Moses was faithful in this. Testifying about words. Christ is faithful, he says, in all God's house as a son. So it's even greater now, comparing he's back to the comparison. Moses is a servant, Christ is a son. And ultimately, where he's going to go in the book is to say, you're not a servant, you're a son. You have been elevated beyond the call of Moses by your baptism into Christ, by being made an heir of the world to come. All the more reason to take your calling seriously. To take your election as one which has ramifications for day-to-day life. Christ is faithful as a son and over the house. Now, he doesn't say you're a son now, though. He says you're the house. Like Moses as well. You're the house of Christ. If indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. So he does. He leaves you with a little bit of a, a twing at the end. Christ is sufficient. You are His if you believe it. If you hold fast to it. And what is He asking you to hold fast to? Two things. I love this language. They're good things. We would want to hold fast to these things. Our confidence and our boasting. Confidence and boasting. I've had a a fairly fascinating experience more than once in my life now where... Because I put videos on the internet where I talk about the Bible, I've eventually run into a human being or received a letter from a human being who says, when I first saw you, I hated you so much. You were so arrogant and proud. You thought you knew everything. But I had to keep listening for some reason. And now I know that you're not. And you just have confidence in the Word of God and the Gospel. I don't know if I've ever gotten better compliments than that. And I don't want to lift myself up as so great here. My point is to to distinguish between confidence in the word and pride. 
Don't think that because we are to be humble people, we are to be embarrassed of our faith or afraid to speak it. Or that when somebody would accuse us of being hateful, we have to say, oh, well, maybe I am. No. You fall back on the scriptures which you know, but that's just it. You can only be confident in the scriptures when you know them. When you read them, when you study them, when you mark, learn, and inwardly digest them. Hold fast to that confidence. Hold fast to the confidence that Christ is risen from the dead. And that this explains everything. Everything in the world is explained by this. No other story. No other story has a hope of explaining what we see. The atheist's favorite arguments are always the problem of evil. How could a good God create this evil world? And yet, as much as that is their favorite argument, they also still insist that there's evil in the world. But without God existing, you have no measuring stick by which you can define evil. If all things come out of accidental chaos and an explosion that nobody can explain, there's no such thing as good or evil. There's only random chance. It all must be for the best evil that there is is what you define. And so why are you so concerned about good and evil if you don't believe in it? And how can you even use it in an argument against me? You can't. It's not part of your worldview. So stop using my worldview as if you can use it. It's my worldview, the belief that evil exists. Now, if you didn't follow me on that track, that's okay. But the point is that we are given confidence to understand everything in a way that nobody else can. And it's not based on our own wisdom. It's based on simple words of God. And it doesn't even have to be the most extreme of those. Deuteronomy, Numbers, Leviticus. Just your Ten Commandments, your creed, and your Lord's Prayer make you the wisest of all people if you know what they mean. Confidence. And then boasting. Boasting in what? Ourselves? No. Boasting in our hope. Boasting that we're immortal. Boasting that Christ has been raised from the dead. Alleluia. Today's the last day you get to say Alleluia for a while. It's going to vanish. So that we remember how important it is to know that Christ has been raised from the dead. Alleluia. Holy brothers, my friends here at St. Paul, you share in a calling from God. Jesus has baptized you into his name. So consider him both as Savior sufficient and complete and as one who is faithful in his calling and so does indeed expect you to care about yours. In the name of Jesus, amen.